Well, good evening, everyone. It's about time for us to begin our evening worship. Glad you could make it back to, to worship with us tonight. I see we've got a couple of visitors with us. Glad, glad y'all could be here. Um, as always, uh, we'll do our announcements at the end of service. I'd ask everybody, please check your cell phones for now. Make sure they're set to, to uh, silent mode. And we will begin our worship with the, with the prayer. Almighty God, dear Father, we humbly approach you again this hour. We praise your name. And Father, we pray that the things that we do throughout all of our lives will glorify you to the best of our ability. Father, as we gather here this, this afternoon to worship you again, we pray that we will be strengthened and uplifted by the things we say and do here collectively to, to praise and honor you. And Father, the time that we spend with, with you, the time we spend with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray will help us to be better equipped and better armed to take on the challenges of this world and, and withstand the fiery darts of the devil. We pray, Father, that you will please be with those in the congregation who are ailing in whatever way, Father, that you'll please help us to reach out to them and comfort them as much as we can. We pray, Father, though, that you will ultimately be the one who provides uh, for, for whatever their situations may be. Father, please be with this congregation. Help us to be a beacon of light in this neighborhood and in this area. And we pray, Father, you'll please bless us with workers who are willing and ready and able to share the gospel with those that they come in contact with. We pray, Father, that that will be done in our lives in all things and that we will live our lives so that we, when that judgment day comes, we'll be found faithful. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And we will turn to number 42, Beulah Land. Number 42, I've reached the land of love divine and all its riches freely mine. Here shines a dimmed one blissful day for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away. Across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. My Savior comes and walks with me and sweet communion here have we. He gently leads me by his hand for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. A sweet perfume upon the breeze is born from ever vernal trees and flowers that never fading grow where streams of life forever flow. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where Mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. The zephyr seem to float to me, sweet sounds of heaven's melody, as angels with the white robe throng join in the sweet redemption song. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. And if you will... 
We're going to turn to number 51. And following the singing of this song, we'll have the scripture reading and then the lesson for the evening. And you may want to go ahead and mark number 718, which will be the invitation song for this evening. Then back to number 51. Now, you probably notice if you look back in the back where they have the songs listed in the different categories, it has it listed as a communion song. But very honestly, I think it relates more to God's word as such. And Jesus as the bread of life rather than as a communion song. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou did break the loaves, Beside the sea, within the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit has for thee, O living Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou did bless the bread by Galilee. Then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all and all. Good evening. The scripture reading this evening is coming from John chapter 6, verses 31 through 35. Again, that is John chapter 6, verses 31 through 35. I will be reading the New King James Version. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we are going to continue our study in the book of John of the seven I am statements uh, from the book of John. And again, this was one of the requests uh, that received in the, the request box on the foyer. And as I said last week, anybody has any requests, any questions, any thoughts of anything you'd like to study, uh, let, it, let us know. Please place it in the box, and I'd be glad to do my best to go through that. Um, as we went through last week, I mentioned there are um, seven I am statements in the book of John. Um, tonight, last week, we looked at number seven, I am the true vine. And tonight, we're going to be going to John chapter number six, and we're going to be looking at the statement of I am the bread of life. So you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and turn there to John chapter six. We're going to do this a little bit different than as a normal sermon. This is, in a way, kind of, I'd say, a, a study uh, of this passage. And I want to make sure uh, that as we look at this, we really do cover all the context to this. So I actually want us to back up a little bit to the end of chapter 5 of the book of John. And we're going to go back to verse number 45. This was when Jesus was in Jerusalem, 
He had healed a lame man and the pool of Bethesda. And that, of course, in chapter 5, early in the chapter, that had caused a lot of stir. It had caused a big stir among the Jewish people, not only because he had healed a man on the Sabbath day, but also, as it were, he told the man to pick up his bed and walk on the Sabbath day. So this was quite a problem. This was something that really, really bothered the Jews that he had done this. This is one of the instances that was mentioned this morning that they criticized Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, saying that he was really breaking the Sabbath. In chapter 5, verse number 16, uh, they persecuted and they even sought to kill him for what he had done. He rebuked their disbelief. But then if you look at verses 45 through 47, notice what Jesus says to them there. He says, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe in his writings, how will you believe my words? I mean, he really, in a way, he kind of puts them in their place, doesn't he? I mean, he, he says to them, I don't even have to bring a charge against you. I don't have to say much of anything against you because Moses, the one that you put your trust in, the one that you claim to be following, he's the one who shows you your error. You don't believe him. You don't believe what he said. Therefore, you're not going to believe in me and what I'm doing. And that brings us to what is said there in verse number one of chapter number six. It says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So he goes to the sea. And if we find out in verse number two that a great multitude of people followed him. But notice why they were following him. It says that a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those which were diseased. So it sounds like they're, they're seeing something in him. They're desiring something in him. And so he goes up to the mountain and he sat with his disciples. And it says this was pa Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. But then we get in verse number five, Jesus sees the people. And this is a very familiar part of this passage. He sees the people, sees a number of people, and he asks Philip where they could buy bread to feed the people. It says, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, it's a very interesting thing that it says very specifically in verse number six that this was a test. Jesus was actually testing him. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what the solution was, but he still asks this question of where we're going to get bread to feed these people because it was a test. You know, we have a lot of tests in life, don't we? We have a lot of tests in life. Sometimes we don't know how we're going to be taken care of, how we're going to take care of our families. Maybe it's financially, health-wise, or maybe just a new situation in life. Sometimes we don't know how to proceed with things in life. And maybe part of those, the biggest part of those tests is where are we going to look for our solution? When we come up with a test like this, or how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to do this? Whenever we are tested in such a way, maybe the best part of that test is looking at where am I going to go for my solution? Well, I look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Or do we look to his family, our church family to help us? Or do we try to come up with a solution on our own? And we see that's what Philip does here. He's looking at this in a purely physical sense. In verse number seven, he tries to look at it in this, this physical sense with, you know, what is possible perspective. He looks at the 200 denarii that they had, and he knew this isn't enough, not even close to be able to provide even just a little bit of food for everybody there. And, you know, sometimes that's the way we look at things. You know, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. There's not enough me to go around and handle all that life has thrown at me. Well, we need to turn things around. We need to turn things around and we need to look at them from a different perspective. We got to remember that just like Jesus said in Matthew 19, you know, with man, some things aren't possible. With God, all things are possible. And when we go through one of those tough situations in life that we're not sure how to handle it, maybe we need to look at it as a test. Am I going to sweat it out? Or are we going to look to Jesus for the solution that he can provide? Because Jesus definitely had a solution in mind here. As we keep on reading, starting in verse number eight, it says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. 
Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. You know, Andrew, when he's seeing this situation, he sees that the question has come up, how are we going to take care of these people? How are we going to feed these people? Andrew says, well, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a young man that has these five loaves and two fishes, but, you know, that surely isn't going to be enough. You know, my question after I read that the other day, I was just studying this, it really hit me. I was like, how did he know that? I mean, how did Andrew know that? You know, my opinion is maybe and very likely he and some of the other apostles had been going around looking for food at this point. They were looking for options. But at this point, Jesus is going to put this to rest. He says, don't look around for other options. He just tells the 5,000 people to sit down. In verse number 11, it says, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So notice he prays for the food, he distributes the food to the, the disciples or the apostles, and they bring it to the people. And it's notable there, again, he says, as much as they wanted. It says he, where they were able to fill all these people up with the bread and the fish that the Lord broke, prayed for, and broke to distribute to them. They got all they needed. In fact, they didn't even use all the food that was brought out because we see in verses 12 and 13 that Jesus has them pick up the leftovers. It says, so when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. You know, I think this is another very interesting part of this passage. You know, I don't think that Jesus was just teaching them a lesson in going to him for solutions for their problems. Looking to him, the author and finisher of our faith. But I think he was also teaching them a lesson and also, by extension, teaching us a lesson in providence because notice how many baskets of leftovers were picked up notice how many baskets of excess food were picked up well it says 12. you know of course that's a significant number 12 is a significant number it's always been the number of god's people the representative number of god's people there were 12 tribes of israel but there was also 12 disciples 12 apostles here who had distributed the food and now they're going to come back and they're going to bring back each of them a full basket of leftover food each of them had distributed the bread that jesus gave them giving the people as much as they needed and wanted and now they're able to bring back even more than they had distributed well friends that's what we're called to do today we're called by jesus christ to share the gospel to go out and preach the gospel to every living creature and friends we cannot hold back we must declare that whole counsel of God, share all of his promises, share all of his blessings, share all of his guidance. And sometimes when we share so much, we may worry, well, what's going to be left for me? I'm giving so much of myself. I'm giving so much of the Lord. I'm giving so much to the church. What's going to be left in all that for me? Well, if we ever think that way, if we ever worry about, is there going to be enough for me? Well, here's your answer right here. A whole basket full more than you could ever need or want it will be left over for you because as the apostles who had distributed it came back they had more than they began with you know friends we're never going to run out when we distribute that bread of life which is jesus christ and his word that's spiritual food that jesus gives us in fact we're going to gain more in the process all of us need to give our best to distribute that bread here in this area We'll be blessed in that process. Verse number 14, as we get on to the chapter, it says, then those men who had seen, excuse me, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were uh, about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So at this point, you know, the people after seeing this, they know it is undeniably a miracle. It is an amazing thing that he was able to take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 plus people here. So they knew there was something special about him. In fact, they say, well, he is the prophet. And But Jesus saw in verse number 15 that they were going to try to make him king. In other words, and notice it's a little lowercase king, lowercase k king here, not king of their lives. So he went away by himself. 
But I also say in verse number 14 has something else that is of note. You know, they called him the prophet. They seem to be calling him the Messiah. They seem to be very assured of this. They say this truly is the prophet just after they had eaten the bread that he gave them. And maybe this is one of the, if maybe not the most important thing that we should get from this passage. And that is that once we have tasted the bread that Jesus offers us, we too will be assured in our faith. We need to taste what he gives us. We need to taste the bread that he gives us. Not just sample, but we need to taste it. Remember the passage for uh, 1 Peter chapter 2? It says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Verse number two, that's the one that we all remember. Desire that pure, sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's a command there, friends. It says, you and I, we don't need to just read the Bible. It's not like a command that says you need to go and read the Bible every day and check that mark off so you can have uh, confidence that you're a good uh, person for the Lord. No, no, that's not what it says. He says more than that. He says you need to desire it. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to change desires. It's hard to change what we want out of life. It's hard to change sometimes what that we're looking for. But yet here we have as plain as day, Peter wrote it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. You need to have, we need to have a desire for the word of God. Desire that pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Well, how do we do that? Well, verse number one, you know, we got to lay aside evil, lay aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. We get that. But then what about verse number three? It says, grow, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I think that's a key part of it. I think that's part of what Jesus was doing there in John chapter six. He said, I'm giving you a taste. I want you to taste this. I want you to desire it. If we really do taste the grace of the Lord through his word, we taste the grace of the Lord by looking at what God has forgiven us of. We taste the grace of the Lord by knowing that when we should have been on the cross for our sins, knowing that the wages of sin is death, that Jesus gave his life for us, that is getting a wonderful taste. And that's what helps us grow that desire. We need to have that in our lives. You know, I think about um, Ezekiel chapter number, uh, I believe it's chapter number three. In Ezekiel chapter number three, God had given Ezekiel a, uh, a scroll. And he says, I want you to eat it. I want you to eat it. I want you to take it in. You know, it sounds like a bizarre thing. Every time I've read that or thought about it, it sounds like a very bizarre thing. But that's the truth of what God wants us to do with his word. Take it in. Not just have it in us, but make it a part of who we are. And that's what's going to help us to grow. When we have that taste, it's going to help us desire. And I think that's part of what Jesus was doing here in John chapter 6. Starting in verse number 16 through 21, we see the apostles, you know, after this has happened, after the 5,000 have been fed, you know, the apostles, they get in a boat. And they go to Capernaum, but Jesus is left behind there. And he joins them by walking on water. Now, verse number 18 says that there was a storm while he was walking, and he actually had to walk three to four miles. It's very interesting that it says that in verse number 19. It says, so when they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. You know, friends, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of applications that can be made from this passage of Scripture. You know, how far the Lord is willing to go to be with us, what he's willing to go through to get to us, what he will go through with us. You know, there's so many things that can be applied just from those verses right there. But maybe most notably, look at verse number 19 again. It says that they saw him walking on water in the storm. But they were afraid. Why? You know, since Jesus had to identify himself there in verse number 21, he says, it is I, do not be afraid. It, we can gather that they were afraid, not just because of the storm, not just because there was somebody seemingly magically walking on the water, but they were afraid because they didn't recognize him. 
at the distance that he was at and through the storm that they were having to peer through, they didn't recognize him. They let the storm obscure their sight. They let it obscure their understanding, their recognition of the Lord. Do we do the same ever? Do we recognize Jesus in the storms of our lives? Do we see him when there's a storm in our lives? Do we see him because he's there? Do we focus on him Or do we keep our focus on the storm and the problems? Do we keep on looking at the rain and the the rough seas? Or do we look at the master of the seas? Verse number 21, as we continue on, it says, Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. You know, friends, I think last week as we were looking at uh, the other passage about Jesus being the true vine, I said, you know, this is one of those places where he had all those people trying to kill him, trying to stone him. And here he walked out to the midst of them. That was one of those miracles that we sometimes miss. Here's another one right here in verse number 21. Because it says, as soon as he was on the boat, they were suddenly exactly where they needed and wanted to go. I don't think I'd ever noticed that before. It's another thing that just was a wonderful thing to see in reading over and over this passage in John chapter 6. You know, I think that is a wonderful application for us. You know, if we, we go through storms, we go through problems in life, if we just let Jesus be with us, and if we're with him in faith, bringing him into our lives, we're going to get where we need to go. We're going to get where he wants us to be, but we've got to have him with us. And as we go on through verses 22 and through 25, we read that the people back on the shore, they realize Jesus is gone. They go across to the other side of the sea to Capernaum to find him. And in verse number 25, it's like they're very surprised when they see him. They say, Rabbi, when did you come here? You know, they couldn't believe that he was there in a way. But the truth is, they should have never, and we should never be surprised where Jesus is at. Because if we're faithful to him. There isn't anywhere that we go in life as his children that he isn't already there. Because as we'll be studying later in another lesson, he is our good shepherd. And that's what shepherds do. They go out before their sheep. In verse number 26, in verse 27, Jesus addresses the people. He helps them put this into perspective. He says, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me. Not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. He says, I know why you're here. I I know exactly why you're here. You you didn't interpret the signs, and you but you saw me, and you saw me, and you're seeking not you didn't interpret the signs and see me and seek me for salvation. He said, You seek me to fill your stomachs, not your soul. He tells them in verse number 27 to work to have the food given by him, the one who God has set a seal on, not on that physical food. Verse number 28 says, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as is written, he gave them bread of heaven to eat. You know, that's where we, that's where we had a scripture in this evening. And friends, notice what they're doing here. They're saying, give us a sign. You know, it's amazing that they're asking for this after they've seen him break five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people. But now they say, give us a sign. They said, our fathers ate manna in the desert. You know, give us bread like Moses gave us. But then notice what happens again, starting in verse number 32. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I don't think it get any simpler than that. He spelled it out for them. He's flat out told them, I am the bread of life, bread of life. I'm the one that's sent by the Father in heaven, verse 32. I am the one that gives life to the world, verse 33. He says, I'm the one that fills the spiritual needs of all, verse number 35. But now, unfortunately, they really don't like this. 
In verse number 41, they complained, thinking they knew his origin. Verse number 52, they quarreled among themselves, thinking they knew his meaning, but they were mistaken. You know, after saying that he was the bread of life in verse number 51, he said that they must eat that bread. And, you know, they weren't thinking spiritually at this point, but they were physically thinking through this. And they said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And then in verse number 60, it says, for many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And in verse number 66, we find out from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They were confused. They were seeing things just from a physical and literal perspective, and they could not understand. And because of that, they were discouraged there in verse number 66, and some of them left to follow him no more. And of course, as we finish the chapter around and we get into verses 67 and following, said, then said Jesus to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And you can almost hear the sadness in the voice of Jesus in verse 67. But we can see the faith of Peter as he responds. You know, friends, there's a lot of applications. There's a lot of things that we learn from this passage, and hopefully I've already pointed out a few of those to you as we've gone through there. And I will have to say that it is, this has been one of those passages that having read it several times in this most recent study, I've seen things in there, been reminded of things that I don't know if I ever noticed before. And friends, it doesn't matter if you've read something a thousand times or even more than that. Read it again. Every single word of the, of the Lord is important, and we can always learn something. And maybe with our different times in life, our different perspectives in life, we may see something different today that we've never seen before. But a few different applications that I see here in this chapter with this passage here are first the lesson of perspective in a way, that we need to look to Jesus for what he is, not for what he has. You know, these people in this passage, you know, they were looking to Jesus for what he had. They were looking to him for what he could give them, a physical benefit, a bread benefit. But Jesus stopped them and said, no, I'm not going to give you a bread that's in my hands. I'm going to give you my hands because I am the bread. You know, this, this goes back to a question of dedication that we can ask ourselves. This is, a, this is an application of dedication that we need to ask ourselves maybe even daily. Am I seeking Jesus just because of the salvation he can give me? Or am I seeking him because of the salvation that he is? Or maybe we can think about it this way. Do I seek salvation and want to go to heaven just because it's better than the alternative? Or do I seek it because he is there? And as Peter said, because there is no alternative. Do I seek him for what he is to me? Or do I seek him for what he can give to me? You know, friends, we need to look at this in a lesson of perspective. We need to look to Jesus for what he is and not just for what he has. Number two, we can also learn from this passage that this points to the superiority of Christ as the living bread. You know, people wanted manna. They basically said, you know, we, our, our, our fathers were given bread by Moses. You know, give us this bread. You know, they were looking for that daily bread, the bread that would last them one day and had to be given the next. Jesus said, no, 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 that's not the way I work. I'm going to give you bread that will last you forever. I'm going to give you myself. This shows the superiority of the Christ. Reminds me also of Hebrews chapter 10. We'll read about the superiority uh, superiority of the, the sacrifice of Jesus. As opposed to the blood of bulls and goats that had to be continually offered year after year. There was a once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. This lesson, this passage shows us the superiority of Jesus. But then also number three. We, we also learn about the intake of the bread, that it must be eaten. And I mentioned this earlier, back in verses 53 through 56, you know, Jesus mentions, he says, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. See, again, that point that Jesus is making there is he doesn't want to be a part of our lives. He wants to be our lives. You know, Jesus is our life. He is the bread that we take into our lives. He is our lives through his word. And we, we 
give our lives to him by living out his word, Matthew 7, 21. He isn't just a part of our life. He is our life, Colossians 3 and verse number 4. And also that our lives are hidden with him in God, Colossians 3 and verse number 3. And he doesn't just want to live in us. Excuse me, he doesn't want to just live with us, but he wants to live in us. Like Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. You know, that's, that's some of the things that we see, some of the simple things that can just be seen through John chapter 6. And I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about that as well. You know, it's night, during the week, whenever. Share with me what you get out of this passage. Share with me what you learn about Jesus and our relationship with him through John chapter 6. Because, again, this was left not just for a, a, a fact-finding mission. It wasn't just left for historical value but it was left for great spiritual encouragement and spiritual value. There are many things to be learned. But tonight, the, 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 the lesson is yours. I, I appreciate, again, uh, the opportunity to, to study something with you and talk about with you something that was a desire of one of the members here. And again, if you have anything that you'd like to study, you'd like us to go over together, please let me know. I'd be glad to do that. But tonight, if there's anyone here that has a spiritual need, whether it is to give your life to Christ in baptism or if you as a member of the Lord's body, you need some help in some way. We're here to help you. If there's anything we can do for you of a spiritual nature, let us know. We'll be glad to help as we stand and sing. Who at the door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me. If thou wilt heed my calling, I will abide with thee. All through the dark hour dreary, knocking again is he. Jesus, art thou not weary, waiting so long for me? Sweetly the dawns are falling, open the door for me. If thou wilt heed my calling, I will abide with thee. Door of my heart I hasten, thee will I open wide. Though he rebuke and chasten, he shall with me abide. Sweetly the dawns are falling, open the door for me. If thou wilt heed my calling, I will abide with thee. Be seated, please. I understand we have those who have a need to partake of the Lord's Supper. Which we'll turn to number 283. And we'll sing this song before there's an opportunity then to partake of the communion. And... Jesus, keep me near the cross, number 283. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. 
near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory and till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the rim near the cross o lamb of god bring it scenes before me help me walk from day to day with the shadow o'er me in the cross in the cross be my glory and till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the rim <clears throat> For those needing to partake of the Lord's Supper, did you all get a, get one of these? Is anybody that did not get one? Okay. At this time, let's bow our hearts and give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, thank you so very much for thy son, Jesus Christ, who willingly sacrificed himself on the cross for our behalf. We thank thee, Father, that he suffered through the things that he suffered and that he went to the cross without complaint and that he did so to provide salvation to all the world. We thank thee, Father, for this bread that represents his body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for the blood of Jesus Christ, thine only begotten son. We thank thee, Father, that he shed his blood on the cross and that it is his blood that provides the cleansing of our sins. We pray, Father, that you'd bless us as we partake of this Lord's Supper, as we remember his death on the cross, as he said, do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents his blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's offer a prayer for the contribution as well. Dear God, again, we thank you so much for the bountiful blessings that we enjoy every day. Father, we thank you for our homes. We thank you for our jobs and the, the ability that we have to, to provide for our families and for ourselves. We know, Father, that ultimately these things come from you. And Father, we just want to say thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for the ability that we have now to give back a portion of that, of those blessings to you. And we pray that all who do so at this time will do so with cheerful hearts and that the funds collected will be used in a manner that is acceptable to you as well. We give especially in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. We don't really have uh, too many updates um, from, from this morning. But I uh, do want to announce that we have a, a new brother 
in Christ. Uh, James Dawson, one of the How guys, he's been with us uh, for, he's been coming here for, for uh, a while now. Um, he usually sits in the back, in the back corner there. Uh, he was here this morning. He was baptized on October 20th. So next time you see him next Sunday, he'll more than likely be here. Uh, give him a hug and welcome him to, uh, to the family of God. That's James Dawson. We also uh, want to be mindful of Scott going in for uh, some some medical work this week uh, to see how his uh, how his status is for the tumor uh, that see if there's any regrowth or any medical issues like that that need to uh, to be taken care of. So please pray for a successful outcome with that. And then we have uh, the Bentley family, uh, a myriad of issues going on with. Uh, with brothers and sisters there. Um, Brenda, Brenda's brother, Mike Harris, had surgery last week to remove the last uh, three toes on his foot. His wife, Vicki, also uh, will have an angioplasty tomorrow to unclog three arteries. And Ron's sister, Susan Smith, uh, has, has not been eating. And so she uh, she's causing her to lose, lose weight and lose strength. So uh, please uh, pray for them as well. Um, uh, we, uh, the only thing we know about uh, about uh, Scott Woods right now is that the, on Friday, right before the uh, the fellowship, uh, he was taken to, to have blood pressure uh, checked with the the VA in, a, in an urgent care. I think uh, I think uh, we got an update from them today that he's doing okay, uh, but I don't have a lot of details on that. Thank you, thank you. The Monday Night Ladies class is postponed for the next two weeks, or will resume on November 13th. The men's assignments are posted on the track rack, so please, uh, for November, so please get one of those and uh, check to see what, uh, what you've been assigned for the month of November. And today is the final day to donate items for the October Help Your Neighbor list. And we just, again, want to say thank you so much for everyone that's participating with that. And November 5th will be the end of daylight savings time. So don't forget next Saturday night to roll back your clock. So enjoy being here on time with everyone else. We also have um, a FOT flyer that's on the table where the community is. This is a flyer for the gospel meeting that we're going to be hosting with Brother Scott Springer on the 17th through 19th of November. And so we want everybody to go ahead and plan ahead for that. Please make a room in your schedule for that. It's going to be Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday. Uh, that the Friday and Saturday services will be at 7 p.m. Sunday will be at, uh, at uh, 1030 and then 5 p.m. our normal times. We're also going to have a uh, a meal, a congregation-wide fellowship, traditional congregation-wide fellowship, asking everybody to bring pot, you know, their favorite potluck meal. And uh, we're all gonna be together uh, for that. So please uh, please make preparations to join us for that. It will be a very good time. And uh, this would be a good opportunity to bring neighbors, bring bring friends, family, all who, uh, who you think would, would benefit from hearing the gospel that's not already a Christian. Uh, and that would also, uh, for those who are Christians, to help build us up as well. The theme is we're more than conquerors. So please get a flyer. You'll get more information about, the, about that off the table. Um, and before we uh, turn it over to our, our last song and uh, closing prayer, I uh, just want to acknowledge that today is Sister Betty Ellis's birthday. So please uh, give her a hug uh, on uh, uh, when you see her on the, on your way out. I believe it's 39, right? 30, 39, maybe? Maybe not. All right. Anyway, let's be standing for our closing song and closing prayer. Number 163, he keeps me singing. And we'll just sing the first two verses of this song. 163. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. 
Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath the sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had today to come and worship you this morning and this evening. We thank you for the lessons from Brother Scott. Father, help us to meditate on those lessons, meditate on your word that we might grow stronger. Father, we pray a special prayer for Brother Scott as the upcoming test that he's going to be having done. We pray that he gets a good report from uh, the, the uh, meeting with the doctor. We pray for the Bentley family, Father, for their relatives and friends, Mike Harris and Susan Smith. We pray that they will have a good outcome with the things they're dealing with. We pray that uh, you'll watch over them and, and help us to be there to encourage the Bentleys and our brothers and sisters and, and uh, those individuals that they're uh, supporting. Father, we pray for Scott Woods that uh, he has a good outcome. We don't know more than uh, him going to the hospital, but we pray that the doctors were able to help him. We pray for the Grubb family, Father, that's overseas in Indonesia and the we pray that they can do much good over there, and we ask that you'll continue to watch over them uh, in that uh, environment, that they are safe and, and doing much good for you. Father, we pray for our upcoming gospel meeting. We pray that it'll be uh, good for the congregation here, good for the kingdom, the things that are being done. We pray for our elders, that you'll uh, be with them, Father, as they make decisions for the congregation. We ask that you'll watch over us as we leave and go to our homes, Father, with the uh, inclement weather that's coming in. We pray that we'll be able to get home safely uh, through the uh, this evening. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice and that through him we have a hope of eternal life. We ask that you'll continue to be with us, Father. We know there are others that are dealing with the loss of loved ones. We pray that we might be able to encourage them. There's others that with medical issues, Father, we pray for their uh, good outcome from their situations, and if, as we have opportunity, we can encourage them. Father, keep us safe and forgive us of our sins, as we pray in Jesus' name, amen.